Welcome. Um, my name is Nikki Aiello. I am a recovery and life transition coach. So that basically means that I help people recover from destabilizing life experiences and transitions, even if they're positive ones. It doesn't always have to be negative. Um, but, you know, life can shake us up often. And um, sometimes it can be really overwhelming. And it's nice to have somebody who's been down the road to help you gather resources and um, offer you support, compassionate support and, you know, no judgment, unbiased reflection, all that kind of stuff. Resources is a big one for me in particular. Um, so, and I do have personal experience in the realm of depression, you know, basically life-threatening depression and body wrecking um, substance abuse and addiction. So I have, um, um, I'm passionate about this and I'm happy, I'm um, passionate about helping people, especially dealing with those, um, you know, specific experiences, but I love working with everybody because I've found that recovery in general involves so many of the same aspects, you know, it's lifestyle, it's community, it's routine, it's so much. So anyway, that's what I do. And um, a large part, like I said, of what I do is gather resources, and that includes people, um, experts in their field. So nutritionists, therapists, um, psychiatrists sometimes if needed, body workers, doctors of different kinds. And this is, um, I love doing this. I feel like I have really great taste in people and in experts. Um, so it's very helpful. I feel like that's where, that's my skill is bringing together teams and being pragmatic and helping figure, people figure out, you know, what their new priorities are and how to go about it in a manageable way and one that's gonna be sustainable. So Kelly is one of those people um, now in my pool of resources and referrals um, to help people bring balance into their life, mentally, physically, and emotionally. So um, I was super happy, like basically the universe just kind of brought me to, brought her to me one day. I was scrolling through something and she popped up in a, on Alignable and I'm not even on Alignable and whatever. I've wanted to connect with an addiction nutritionist for many, many years because nutrition has been a huge part of my own um, journey. Huge. And anybody, anybody who knows me knows that um, I've always, you know, been a huge proponent of its power, especially in overcoming depression, addiction, anything mental. You know, a lot of people just don't realize the power of um, biology on psychology. And I stole that term from Mark Hyman, one of his interviews the other day, which was really wonderful. He's um, got a podcast called The Doctor's Pharmacy with FARM. Um, so that's a little bit about me. Um, and let's see, I have some little notes here because there's so much. I can't, there's there a little echo. Are you guys okay? Or is that just me just hearing that? There's no, I don't hear an echo. You're good? Okay. That must just be something with my own stuff. Um, so I recently did, um, I was part of Kelly's beta group for her nutri uh, nutrition addiction. What was the course called, Kelly? Um, it's my pause protocol small group. Okay. And pause protocol is post addiction withdrawal syndrome, mm -hmm. which Kelly post acute withdrawal syndrome. Thank you. So she's going to go more into that in just a second. I want to read you a little bit about her and then have her talk. Um, so Kelly Miller is a nutritional therapist and recovery coach. She lives here in Denver with me, um, who specializes in nutrition for addiction. She helps clients uncover the biochemical root cause of their addictions and cravings in order to create a targeted nutrition or targeted nutrient and supplement plan designed to help them improve mood, reduce cravings and prevent relapse. She also works with treatment facilities to train clinical staff, educate, educate patients facilitate nutrition therapy programs and create or improve nutrition programs. And that's another area that I'm really, I have a lot of passion for. I've worked um, within and around treatment centers in the past and it's driven me crazy, their lack of knowledge and education um, about nutrition and addiction, biochemistry through food um, for their patients and clients. So mm -hmm. Anyway, so Kelly, welcome. Um, I would love for you to, you know, tell us a little bit about more like how you work, what you do and how you came, how you came to arrive at this work. Hmm. Okay. Um, 
Well, I'll start with the backstory and I'll try to keep it short because it really started when I was like six years old. Um, but when, when I was really young, my brother, my older brother was diagnosed with leukemia. Um, but in the first like few years of my life, he struggled with addiction and went to a inpatient treatment facility for an extended amount of time. Um, and addiction at that point really became a part of my story and my family's story. Um, I was, as much as I was, uh, you know, my parents tried to shelter me from the repercussions of what that looks like. I was exposed to, um, you know, the emotional aftermath and sort of the, the tension within the household when he was going through the addiction. And not long after that, he ended up being diagnosed with leukemia and actually went into the hospital full time and passed away. Well, that, that, that's a, you know, this whole big story, but was sort of like the beginning of my, my passion for addiction and my own kind of personal trauma, which I ended up treating with food. Um, Cause as a young child, you don't really know what you need or why you need it. Your brain, even with adults, right? Your brain just will seek out what you need. And so I wasn't getting really what I needed from my parents and my family in terms of the tools I needed to cope with the emotions of that situation. And so I naturally just moved on to Oreos and chocolate milk and a lot of bread. Um, and that really set the path for, you know, decades of food addiction that I didn't even realize I had until I was well into my thirties. Um, and, and so it started with that. And then like in my early teens, it was nicotine and then eventually alcohol. Um, and, and just, um, you know, went through life sort of knowing that these addictions were simmering under the surface, but never really identifying or connecting that those were real issues and they were connected to literally everything else in my life, specifically my mood. Um, you know, I, I kind of went through life wondering like, what's wrong with me? Like, why am I the moodiest person I've ever met? You know, like besides my parents, <laughs> um, you know, they're moody and I'm moody, but like, what's up with that? And so a lot of shame with that. Um, you know, I had undiagnosed ADD as a child, which is pretty rare for a girl in the 80s um, to, to be diagnosed with ADD. Um, it was sort of just kind of coming around. So, so I'm probably giving more detail than I need to, but, but all of that kind of set the course for chronic disease. So when I hit my early 30s, literally 30, um, I came down with chronic illness, autoimmune disease. I got three autoimmune diseases in the matter of just the first couple years of my thirties. Um, and, and kind of had like this vague notion that there was a connection to food there, but wasn't really sure. Um, doctors were like, ah, you know, we really can't help you. Um, you'll probably just need to take medication for the rest of, of your life. You'll learn to manage it. You know, that was literally like all I got. And so I just was it's like, horrible. no, this is, yeah, this is not happening. Um, there's, there has to be an answer. And so I took to the internet and, um, after lots of, um, investigating and researching, I realized that food played a huge role in this and that there were many, many, many testimonials on the internet of individuals with different autoimmune disorders who completely reversed their autoimmune, autoimmune disorders with nutrition. Um, and so that's what led me into the world of nutrition. Meanwhile, I'm always kind of, um, borderline obsessed with learning about addiction and wondering why I'm addicted to things, but never really seeking help. And so um, that's where the intersection met. So in my thirties, I started to implement these nutritional protocols to heal from my chronic illness, but started to very quickly realize that they had a major impact on my mood. And my mood was this, this huge stumbling block for me in terms of overcoming my addictions, because I'm stressed, I'm depressed, I'm anxious, I'm doing, you know, I'm feeling all of these emotions. So I'm self medicating with food and nicotine and alcohol, alcohol. And, and so that's when I started to realize this whole, you know, how these two things really intersected. And so as I'm putting these protocols into play in my own life, and I'm finding healing from my chronic illness, I find I'm completely stabilized in terms of my mood, which changed everything when it came to feeling like I could finally quit smoking and I could finally quit drinking and, and do all these things that I had wanted to do forever, but I just literally could never figure out how. Um, and so that just was like, okay, this is my purpose in life. You know, um, that these, these things I became incredibly passionate about. And so started researching that even more and found that there was information out there. You had to kind of dig to find it. And there were like a handful of practitioners doing this type of work. And so I just sought them out. Um, and, and I got training and I launched my business in 2019 of last year. Um, and so that's where I am now. So what I do is 
um, as a nutritional therapist and a recovery coach, I really specialize in addiction. And so I take clients that fall anywhere on that spectrum of addiction. So they may be looking to quit um, drinking, but they find themselves to be more of a gray area drinker. Um, you know, maybe they're not drinking every day, but they're just kind of wondering, why can't I give up my wine habit, you know, mm -hmm. all the way to kind of full blown, you know, alcohol use disorder. Um, but, but not just alcohol, cocaine, methamphetamines, marijuana, anything, any type of substance, um, including sugar that has the potential to be addictive, um, I work with. And so that really just looks like one-on-one -on -one coaching, small group programs. Um, and then I'll be launching, um, some really new and exciting programs in January, um, in terms of testing. So I'm excited about that. Oh, I can't wait to hear more about that. Yeah. I definitely want to like continue to be one of your you know, students and participants and all of this stuff. Awesome. You are a wonderful student. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, does anybody have any questions? I do. I do. I've always got the questions. <laughs> I love questions. I love questions. I learn so much through questions. So it's good. For right. Me. I know. Me too. So um, speaking of, um, if you've signed on um, just recently, we are taking questions. If you want to send in anything um, at any time, you can send in questions and then we'll get to those by the end of the um, session today. So, um, Right now, like I am really wanting to, you know, I do these interviews sometimes weekly, every other week sometimes, and um, they're just my favorite thing. I just love connecting with brilliant people and learning stuff and sharing the resources is really what this is mostly about. Um, there's a lot of, you know, my co coaching clients and when I recommend this or that, um, you know, the different types of therapy or the different types of nutrition or to learn about what is functional medicine, what is inflammation, what is this or that, you know, it's nice to just be like, here, listen to this person, you know, or check this out. And right now, just in light of the holidays, in light of winter, um, of COVID and of this, you know, super stressful political situation, um, there's so much potential for for crisis, you know, for people to slide down that slippery slope of abuse and ultimately addiction. And, you know, of course we know depression, anxiety, root causes of most of that. Um, and I want to, so over the next few months, I really want to provide like really awesome resources, you know, and really awesome tools and techniques and just direction. Um, and so that's why I have you, you're kind of like kicking off the, the season of, you know, help how to, prevent a crisis because honestly the work that I do is because I basically didn't have any guidance in my journey my 20 year journey no guidance I just had to you know trial and error research educate all this stuff on my own and I really would um I want to help people do what I did in 20 in like five or less yep you know so that's really important and prevention does take time effort and money but it doesn't take as much as recovery you know, so, um, so that's what I really want to focus on right now, preventing major crises over, you know, this winter season. Mm -hmm. And um, with you, I want to talk about, you know, nutrition, how we can set, how we can set ourselves up to avoid, you know, sliding and um, emotional, you know, roller coasters and all that kind of stuff. So um, there's a couple of things I want to bring up first, and then we can go more into it. In our course, we talked about, you brought up the difference between, um, you know, a psych psychological cravings and biological cravings. And I think that's an important thing for all of us to kind of like sit with and kind of like feel like where our cravings are coming from. And the other one um, are the different types of de depression and anxiety, you know, like there's the lethargic and then there's the anxious. So can you speak to those two things real quick? Yeah. Or not real quick. Can you speak to those two things? Yeah. <laughs> um so talking about distinguishing between psychological cravings and biological cravings, I think is really important because if you can distinguish between where your craving is coming from, it's going to help you to figure out which nutritional tool or, or which tool in general you need to deal with that craving. And so, um, you know, when we talk about the traditional treatment model in the United States, they use this bio, psycho, social, spiritual model. Um, and the bio piece stands for biological and um, the only thing we're doing to treat the biological aspects of addiction is really pharmaceuticals. Um, but, but nutrition, including supplements, um, also falls under that biological piece. And so we're using a ton of cognitive behavioral therapy and um, EDMR and all of these kind of 
um, psychological therapies to help individuals recover from addiction, but we're really ignoring the biological piece. And I think that we're really not helping people distinguish between the biological and the psychological enough. So to break it down really simple, the biological piece is really rooted internally. So oftentimes there are things that go on inside of our biology, which can look like very specific nutrient deficiencies. It can look like imbalances in brain chemicals. And when I say brain chemicals, I'm talking specifically about a group of chemicals called neurotransmitters. These are chemicals um, that exist. They have many different functions. We actually have over a hundred of them, but there's four in particular that have the most effect on our mood. And so that's serotonin, dopamine, GABA, and the endorphins. So, so the biological... Biological cravings are rooted in what's going on inside of our body. And they, and if you don't know what you're looking for, they can be a, a little bit harder to understand because they can just come out of nowhere. Um, and blood sugar plays a huge role in this as well. So when we talk about psychological cravings, um, you know, I said biological was really internal. Psychological is more external. Um, and so not exclusively external, but it's an easy way to kind of simplify it. So maybe... Um, for you, you're a very social person and you love to go out with your girlfriends um, on the weekends. And so you, you go out with your girlfriends every weekend and you're used to drinking with them. And now you've decided to give up alcohol. You're still going out with your girlfriends, but that brings on a very intense um, craving, which I say, I don't want to say it's exclusively external because you can viscerally feel those cravings, right? Mm -hmm. That external cue of sitting down at the table with your girlfriends will trigger um, a, a biological or physiological response, um, but mm -hmm. it but it initiated from outside, right? So it might be a memory, it might be a circumstance, um, it might be a person, you know, that triggers you, and so those are things that are psychologically um, cueing those cravings from inside. But the reason that it's important is because what tool are you going to use in that circumstance? So um, I'll give you just a really brief example. I had one of these psychological cravings just recently, which at this point in my life is pretty rare. Um, so maybe like a couple times a year, even in 2020, I can tell you I've, I've had less than five cravings for alcohol, which is I think pretty incredible. Um, but it's cause I've laid the groundwork and I use the tools and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Um, but I had an emotional day. It was like three different things. I had talked about this on my Instagram, three different things happened in the same day, totally separate instances that cause a very visceral response for me an emotional and stressful response. Um, and I, I didn't have any alcohol cravings. Like I was totally fine. But then I went to sit on the couch with my husband after the kids had gone to bed to watch a movie. And that used to be the cue for me to pour wine. And so I literally, my butt hit the couch and all of a sudden it just washed over me. I had a craving for red wine, which it came out of, you know, left field, but I just sat there for a minute and I was like, okay, what's going on here? And I was like, oh yeah, I had the combination of the very stressful and emotional day with the external cue of sitting on the couch. My brain remembers that routine, sit on the couch, drink the wine, watch the movie, you know? Mm -hmm. And so the intersection of those two things created um, what I would say was mostly a psychological craving for me. So in that moment, I knew, what do I need to do? I need to acknowledge this craving and I need to just shut it down. Like, oh yeah, I can feel it. I would love a glass of red wine, but that's not part of the plan. So we're <laughs> shutting this down. Um, the answer is no. And um, here we go with our, with our movie. And, and, you know, within 30 seconds to a minute, it was gone and it didn't return. Um, so that was the tool that I used in that situation. But mm -hmm. there are other times where. What would you call that tool? Would that just be some sort of recognition, acknowledgement, change direction? You know, there, I'm sure there's like a CBT sort of like. Yes, something or other for that. Yeah, there's so many like letters for it. Um, and, and, what, what can we use to, what can we, how can we make it a tip for the for people listening? Yep. What, so what I would just break it down into, the, into three steps and, and it's, it's always the, the same three steps and I don't remember what they call them because they call them a lot of different things, but it's really just acknowledging what's happening in that moment, recognizing it and creating kind of a, a curious mindfulness around it. Like there's no shame. There's no, I don't need to beat myself up for this. Like what's happening right now. And maybe where's this coming from? Um, and then you, you stick to the plan. So you turn it around, you go, that's, that's not part of the plan. I'm going to switch gears right now. Uh, maybe I need to get up and just drink a glass of water in the kitchen to physically get my body out of that situation because sometimes that will break us out of out of a feedback loop or a neural pathway that's kind of mm -hmm. ingrained into our brain um just kind of getting up and leaving the room and doing something different and mm -hmm. so yeah it's really that it's acknowledging it creating kind of a, a, a kindness towards yourself and a, a mindful curiosity and then changing the script in your brain and and, and it often deals with 
having a conversation with yourself, you know, like mm -hmm. that wasn't mm -hmm. part of the plan. Um, mm -hmm. And we're going to go this other direction. And that's great. I really love that. It reminds, reminds me a little bit of um, some training that I did for, I think it was probably yoga nidra or something. That's, that's a really, um, it's a, it's a studied, it's a well-studied research and um, documented um, yogic technique to deal with stress and to mm -hmm. treat PTS. And they use it in the military a lot. And um, when you're in one of my trainings for trauma informed yoga, I forget which one it was, but they say if somebody does go into a kind of a moment, you know, where they're overcome by some sort of memory or whatever, and then takes them into that sort of feedback loop, which is probably what you're, you know, what you just brought up. Um, you bring them, you just, you, you cut, you just, uh, uh, you just short circuit it. So at that moment you take them out of it, but like, Hey, you know, what did you do today? Like, you know, how was your morning? What'd you have for breakfast? Yeah. And so it's just that quick shift of um, direction and attention. So I like that tip of like, just get up and, and just step out, just change your scene for a moment, disassociate with the thing that associated that you associated with that triggered it. Yeah. So, yeah. Anyway. We call that breaking the feedback loop. So if cool. I had given into that craving, I would have yeah. strengthened that feedback loop where right. the craving was initiated and I completed the circle. And every time you do that, you strengthen that, that neural pathway. But when mm -hmm. you break the feedback loop and you go, Nope, we're doing something different. Your brain learns a new pathway and breaks the old. Pathway. <laughs> it will always be there. So you have to be conscious of that. But every time you choose differently, it weakens the original pathway. That's so, yeah, that's, that's another state of yogic sort of there's, you know, yoga, yogic psychology mirrors modern day psychology perfectly. And I'm sorry about my dog. He'll be quiet oh, here in a second if you can't hear him. But yeah, then yoga, they're called samskaras. They're just, you know, behavioral and thought patterns. And they, they go deeper and deeper every time you, you know, repeat them. But every, th every time you do something opposite, they fill in a little bit. You know, so it's it's contrary action. Mm. Paripaksha bhavana is uh, what that's called in the yoga world. Pickles, pickle stuff. Um, okay, so now going on to the types of depression and anxiety. Will you speak to that a little bit? Sure. So there are different types of, of depression. And so, uh, you know, when I was kind of going back to those four neurotransmitters I was talking about, specifically two of them, serotonin and dopamine. So depression is often linked to either serotonin or dopamine. And um, it's really it's really oversimplified to just simply say it's a deficiency in one of those chemicals because it's not always a deficiency, but there may be something going on that's dysregulating that system. And so you may be producing enough of those chemicals, but they're not being activated or they're not getting to where they need to be in the body and that sort of thing. Um, maybe they're just not consistent. Maybe you get spikes instead of absolutely. steadiness. Absolutely. So when we talk about um, depression in particular, if your depression is related to more to serotonin dysregulation, it's going to feel more like an irritated or agitated type depression. So you may feel like I'm depressed, but I'm really irritable and kind of short with people. Um, oftentimes that depression is more related to serotonin. And if your depression feels more um, paralyzing and catatonic to where um, you don't necessarily feel um, as irritable, but you feel more apathetic and you're just like, you want to lay in bed and you can't find the motivation to get out of bed. You can't, you know, you haven't showered in five days, like that sort of depression. That's really more related to dopamine. Um, and the reason that it's important to recognize that, um, you know, especially in the work that I do is because it, it does inform a little bit about how you're eating. Um, eating for serotonin and dopamine looks very similar, but it, but it really gives you information about supplements, specifically amino acids, and which ones you would want to use in those situations, depending on what your depression looks like. We might as well go right into that then, the amino acids. Because um, I think that kind of covers the anxiety part, because it seems more like the depression is the one with two different types kind of anxiety. I think it's just kind of anxiety and different levels of intensity. Mm -hmm. Right. It, so. could, it could be. Um, if, if we're looking at like an anxiousness, um, sometimes that is related to serotonin. But um, anxiety pr is primarily related to GABA, which is mm -hmm. one of those four neurotransmitters I was talking about. So so the interesting thing about these neurotransmitters is there's a lot of overlap and they all have a relationship with each other. So one mm -hmm. potentiates the other. Some of them have a seesaw relationship. So if you prop one up, you may be suppressing the other. Um, but they all have this really interlinked relationship with each other. So but yes, when we talk about anxiety, it actually has a lot to do with GABA for sure. 
Okay, well, let's talk about, um, let's talk about that. Um, the amino acids, how you decide, you know, what might be appropriate for somebody and all that sort of stuff. Sure. So the what I primarily do is I work with and what they are. Why? Oh. What are they? And why are they important? Absolutely. So, so the program that I've created, which is the pause protocol, pause being the post acute withdrawal syndrome. Um, and I'm not sure we even talked about that. So I might have to circle back a little bit. Um, is a combination of using nutritional strategies really geared towards a couple of main goals. Um, one of those goals is balancing blood sugar, but, but the primary goal is to make sure that your body has the nutrients that it needs to build those neurotransmitters we were talking about. Those neurotransmitters are essentially hormones, and those hormones are made from molecules called amino acids. So when you eat protein, regardless of what form the protein is in, that protein is made up of a combination of amino acids and it's going to look different for every single food so just like we have you know a fingerprint that's different for everybody each food is going to have a different combination of these amino acids um, so if you're looking at you know steak versus chicken versus eggs versus quinoa um, they have a different makeup of amino acids now when we talk specifically about serotonin and dopamine those are a class of um, neurotransmitters called monoamines meaning that they have one single precursor. So I don't want to get too complicated, but to make this sound really simple, the precursor to serotonin is an amino acid called tryptophan. Lots of folks have heard of tryptophan because they go, oh, that's what makes us sleepy on Thanksgiving, right? Because it's in the turkey. That's a myth. We don't get sleepy because we ate tryptophan from turkey. Um, the reason we get sleepy on Thanksgiving is because we have three plates of grandma's biscuits and so much mashed potatoes and gravy and pumpkin pie. It's all of the sugar and the refined carbs that ends up, you know, knocking, knocking us out on the couch and falling asleep. It's not the tryptophan. Mm -hmm. But tryptophan is present in turkey, but it's, it's in very similar amounts in, in chicken and steak and eggs and all of these other proteins. So when we eat those foods, that single molecule, the tryptophan, goes through a conversion process that ends up in serotonin. Serotonin is the, the happy hormone. It has many functions. Um, it's oversimplifying it by saying it's the happy hormone, but, but that is one of its functions. It gives us a feeling of content and satisfaction with life. Um, it prevents us from getting depressed, overly anxious and irritable, um, that sort of thing. It plays a very large role in appetite as well. Um, and, and so when we eat those foods, if our body's working exactly how it should, that amino acid will convert to serotonin. And then interestingly enough, at about three o'clock in the afternoon, the sun starts to kind of go down. That molecule now converts from serotonin to melatonin. And your body is, works on a clock called the circadian rhythm. And that melatonin gets secreted into your bloodstream around nine o'clock at night. So if you will, you're going to eat foods, you're going to use those nutrients properly, you're going to make enough serotonin to feel great, that serotonin is going to be abundant, and you'll be able to convert, uh, convert it into melatonin, and you'll be sleeping great. So one of the primary symptoms of a serotonin dysregulation is that you've got that anxious, irritable depression, you overeat and crave things like sugar and carbs, and you're having trouble sleeping. Um, and so, so the same goes for dopamine. There is a single amino acid precursor, which is um, tyrosine. So same thing. We eat proteins. Tyrosine turns into dopamine. And now we have all of the benefits of, of dopamine. So moving on from talking about how we get those natural substances from food, oftentimes there's just stuff going on in our body. There's inflammation. We have leaky gut. Um, there's also because of this modern life that we live, we're dealing with chronic stress. All of those things combined can really interrupt that process of not just getting what you need, but, but breaking it down and utilizing it properly. And that's where amino acid supplements come into play. So amino acid supplements are those very natural forms of amino acids. Um, they're, they're sourced from food. They're completely natural. They're brought to you in supplement form. And you can now eat the diet and on top of that, take these extra supplements to really enhance um, and support your body to make those neurotransmitters because the end goal is really um, improved mood. And if we're talking specifically about addiction, it's not just improved mood, it's a huge reduction in cravings uh, for whatever your substance of choice is, um, as well as preventing relapse or reoccurrence. Um, because whenever there's an imbalance, whenever there's an imbalance in serotonin or dopamine or any, any of these other ones, 
your brain is going to seek out in your environment whatever it can find to balance that imbalance. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes that looks like sugar. Um, but that will also lead to cravings for alcohol and, again, whatever the substance is that you're particularly craving. I want to make one point about that real quick um, because I don't think a lot of people realize the, that it's not a weakness or a character defect when somebody is you know, craving and, and not able to stay sober or whatever it is that they're dealing with. You know, truly, their mind and body are trying to create homeostasis in the only way that's available to them that it knows or that's present at that moment. You know, so if it's grabbing something with, you know, if it's alcohol, because that sugar and the, and the serotonin that ultimately it will turn into will bring them back to a state of balance, that's what it's going to want. Because Absolutely. that will bring you to a place of actually feeling peaceful. So, you know, it's, there's so much biochemistry behind addiction and, and mm -hmm. so few character defects. Yes, you know? absolutely. That's a really great point because so, so many people, they, you know, they'll ask me this question, you know, why did, um, why did I drink, um, you know, like crazy in, in college and, and I'm not an alcoholic and my, you know, my roommate, Bethany, she, she just went off the deep end and she's an alcoholic. And it's like, they tend to think that it is a morality thing. But the problem is, is that there are so many underlying genetics and environmental factors that play into that, where Bethany was probably much more susceptible to an addiction to alcohol specifically. Mm -hmm. And um, her, her brain and body were literally just seeking out um, what they needed to balance themselves, but, but didn't have, you know, didn't understand the process and, and know the tools. Um, and so, it, it, yeah, it's funny because willpower is such a myth, you know, willpower mm -hmm. is so much more a function of your blood sugar um, than it is your, you know, anything else. And, and, well, and we that talked makes... a lot about that in group, you know, keeping your, your prefrontal cortex activated. And I love that. You, um, the metaphor that you used was staying online. So as long as yeah, we are staying online, which means we have steady, uh, steady blood sugar, which means our body is not in danger of, you know, it's some sort of like mentally mental crash, I guess, you know, like the body is just trying to keep itself alive and alive and safe and relaxed. Mm -hmm. So, um, if you let your blood sugar drop, then now suddenly you're in danger and you go into poor decision-making for numerous reasons. Your brain's not working correctly and it's going to seek out the quickest fix yep. to bring you back online. Absolutely. And so, I mean, if you want to speak more to that a little bit, I just, I'm, it's helpful for me to kind of like re, uh, you know, regurgitate all of the information I got from you, you know? Yeah. Yeah, so. absolutely. And I'm sorry that I've been shaking the phone, but for That's some okay. reason, the IG live is, it sucks the life out of my battery. So I had to plug it in. <laughs> so I'm holding it to the cord. Um, so, um, so yeah, just real briefly, cause we like, we could talk about this forever and I don't yeah. want to bore people to death, but, yeah. but manage, learning how to manage your blood sugar, huge relapse prevention tool, because what happens is when you let your blood sugar drop too low and people who are suffering from an alcohol use disorder, um, are very much prone to this. It's called hypoglycemia. You're kind mm -hmm. of on this blood sugar roller coaster all day long. Um, what happens is, is that your, you know, your blood sugar drops below what we would call baseline and the body goes, oh my gosh, you know, sirens start going off. There's an emergency, there's a crisis going on. And so it immediately switches you um, from using your prefrontal cortex, which is the front, the front part of your brain, um, which is really heavily involved in decision making and pumping the brakes when a temptation comes. And it completely switches to that lower part of the brain uh, that we would refer to as the amygdala or the reptilian part of the brain, which is only concerned with survival. It's mm -hmm. purely instinctual. And so a huge part of learning to manage your blood sugar is keeping you out of that danger zone from creating that switch to happen. Because the minute the blood sugar, the blood sugar drops below baseline, the brain switches. It's, it's literally like a light switch on the wall. It switches and you've lost access um, to your recovery skill set, which is housed in your prefrontal cortex. Um, that's the willpower, right? The willpower is, is here it's not infinite. Um, you know, you can actually exhaust your willpower. Um, and, and, and you need to have access to that part of your brain to pump the brakes when a craving comes on. And if you, if that part of your brain turns off, I mean, you're pretty much, um, you know, you're oftentimes screwed. And so you, we, we teach a lot of, of learning blood sugar management and, and other things too, that will activate that fight or flight. Um, okay. Can you share a few of those? Because I think that's going to be really helpful when we go into like, even though it's COVID times and things are going to be different, we are going to have holiday events. There's going to be sugars and sugar and sweets and cookies and alcohol and all kinds of stuff that 
if we are offline, we will reach for and then set us in a set us up on a roller coaster ride. Absolutely. So what are some things we can do? Yeah. So when we're talking specifically about kind of going into holiday gatherings and that sort of thing, um, a lot of like, like the foundation of nutrition of what I teach is I, we use the model PFF, protein, fat, and fiber. And so, so much, you mentioned this in the beginning, it, prevention is so important. If you can lay the groundwork um, for creating balanced blood sugar and repairing nutrient deficiencies and that sort of thing, you will be able to just coast through difficult situations like holiday gatherings because the groundwork has been done and when you feel nourished you are so much less likely to have cravings so first and foremost um you know and, and if it's confusing when i say protein fat and fiber because that's kind of like foreign um, information for you then i would definitely recommend you know reaching out to me or somebody that can kind of help you walk through these principles but those are three types of foods that are going to help stabilize your mood and create a feeling of satiety and help balance your blood sugar so before going into a holiday event making sure that during the day you're eating meals based around protein fat and fiber and definitely not skipping meals. Like the last thing you would ever want to do is go it like, you don't want to wait all day because you know that your office party is going to have all the goodies and all the food. And it's like, well, I'll save money if I don't eat, you know, I'll wait till I go to the holiday party. Because what will happen is, is that you'll probably eat some, you know, maybe some healthy food, but um, but probably a lot of refined carbs and sugar as well. Since you denied yourself during the day, your body and your, your chemistry will go into overdrive to make you seek those things. You know, and if you've ever experienced that like hangry feeling, you know, the hungry and angry, that's the same thing as what we were talking about with the brain shutting off and going offline um, and, and operating out of the amygdala. So, so laying the groundwork would be just eat all day and, and even eat a meal before you go into one of those events so that you're even more nourished and not hungry and really focus on protein, fat and fiber. Um, but what will, yeah, what will happen if, so say you kind of nourish yourself during the day, but you go in there and you really overdo it with the refined carbs and the sugar, you're really putting yourself in a vulnerable situation because the potential for you spiking your blood sugar and then having it crash and going below baseline is the danger zone. So maybe, you know, say you've got 30 days of sobriety under your belt um, and, and maybe you ate well during the day, but then you went in there and you were like, I'm just going to overindulge a little bit. It's okay. Um, you know, and, and I'm not shaming anybody for doing that, but the danger in that is you spike the blood sugar. It goes too low. Willpower goes out the window. And now next thing you know, it wasn't a part of your plan to be drinking after that party. And now you are. Um, and it's because the blood sugar dropped too low and you lost the ability to make um, a good decision. You didn't have your brain you know, online. And so uh, that's why that's a big reason why managing blood sugar with using the specific nutritional strategies like protein, fat and fiber. Um, but then even to take it further is there are supplements that can help with that, right? So one of these amino acids we were talking about, I told you that tryptophan will convert to serotonin. But before it converts to serotonin, it converts to another molecule called 5-HTP. Um, and this, this is an amino acid supplement that you can take. And I'll go into contraindications in a minute. But 5-HTP is wonderful for um, boosting your serotonin, um, reducing cravings for sugar, carbs, and alcohol. Um, and it's also an appetite control mechanism. And so there have been studies done on 5-HTP where you can take it 20 minutes before a meal and it will prevent you from binge eating. Um, because when you take it on an empty stomach 20 minutes before a meal, it helps to boost that serotonin and it creates a feeling of satisfaction. And so if you're already satisfied, you won't seek that in those foods, right? Um, and, so, and, and so when I talk about supplements, it's really important, um, you know, to work with individuals that can work, can walk you through what a supplement protocol would be targeted and healthy for you. Um, and, you know, and I, and I'm not telling anyone to go out and get 5-HTP um, because I think you need to be more aware of, of how it functions, but you do need to know that if you're taking two SSRIs or an MAOI, you really should not take 5-HTP. If you're taking one SSRI, um, you can take a low dose of 50 milligrams of 5-HTP, but it must be at least six hours away from when you took the SSRI. So those are kind of the main contraindications for that one. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, this, you know, there's so many strategies you can use like that um, going into those situations to, 
to not make you vulnerable to overindulge. Um, and then, cause it can be the overindulgence that actually leads to the relapse, right? Let's talk about um, real quick GABA and anxiety. Okay. So GABA is not only a neurotransmitter, it's also an amino acid. So it can get a little confusing because it's the same name for both. Um, mm. So for instance, serotonin was the neurotransmitter, but 5-HTP or tryptophan was the amino acid. When we're talking about GABA, it's like GABA is a neurotransmitter. GABA is the amino acid. Um, that GABA wasn't very, that wasn't very helpful oh, for them to, for, for them to do. Like, why, like, oh. why would, why would science do that? You know, like, yeah. Who is this Mr. Gabba guy that got lazy <laughs> just name them both? You know, I don't know. Right. Um, so it's a little, it works a little bit different in the body. GABA is made primarily in the gut. Um, and it's made from your, your gut bacteria makes it certain strains of gut bacteria. Um, it's converted from another amino acid that you can find in things like cabbage, um, but specifically fermented foods like kimchi, kefir, sauerkraut. Those foods will actually boost your, your GABA production. But GABA is nature's value. It is your endogenous anti-anxiety hormone. So it's the hormone that your body makes to calm yourself down. When you enter into recovery, um, because most often uh, the substance that you're using is having some sort of effect on GABA, some substances more than others. Um, for example, benzodiazepines stimulate GABA. Um, and, and alcohol stimulate. So if you're somebody that drinks to relax, it's stimulating GABA for you. Um, and so when you enter into recovery or you stop you know, consuming whatever the substance is that you have a problem with, um, GABA bottoms out. And what happens is, is it has a relationship with another amino acid called glutamate. And so GABA bottoms out and glutamate goes through the roof. And glutamate is excitatory and GABA is inhibitory. So if your GABA is being suppressed, you don't have enough of that chemical inside your body to just relax. So you feel like overwhelmed and skittish and unable to relax um, and lots of anxiety. Um, and, and that's the GABA. It, the GABA is too high. It's overexciting your brain cells. It's making you really anxious. Um, feels like your brain is spinning sometimes. And so that's one of the number one supplements that we use um, for people, especially when they're in early recovery, because the balancing of those neurotransmitters is usually really out of whack. I mean, that's what creates the, that awful anxiety in those first few weeks um, mm -hmm. when you've removed the substance and you're now trying to learn how to cope with your own body and your own body's tools. Um, and so, you know, going back to post-acute withdrawal syndrome, because I don't think I actually gave you the definition of that, that's just a catch-all term that the medical community uses to describe the symptoms that happen in early recovery. Um, and when I say early recovery, it's usually like that first one to two years, but it's typically like anxiety, depression, insomnia, brain fog, lack of libido, lethargy, mood swings, cravings. Mm -hmm. um, and so all of these things we're talking about the food, the supplements, they're all designed to help improve those symptoms by balancing out the brain chemistry, repairing nutrients um, that might be depleted, reducing inflammation and looking at some of those other mechanisms that may be in play that's causing the dysregulated um, neurotransmitters. And so um, that's what the pause protocol does. It's designed to address all of those symptoms. And, and again, like I said, some people fall very low on that spectrum of addiction where it's just like you know it was the wine or the marijuana and maybe it was recreational but they didn't like the power that it had over them so they're trying to give it up all of this stuff can help too it's such such fascinating amazing important stuff mm. and, and it's so like it's just practical like it exists mm -hmm. you know and people just don't know of it of its existence you yeah. know and it Our recovery time. recovery and addic you know recovering from addiction letting go of substances doesn't have to be as hard as it is <laughs> yes i love that you said that because that's the truth right there it's it's it is hard but it's when fucking we, really hard it's, <laughs> it's so really hard. hard it's so hard but when we ignore these tools that are essentially free i mean mm -hmm. you know what i mean like just you change the way you're eating a little bit and you change when you're eating a little bit. Like it's, it's, everybody should have this information because they're so impactful and they're so powerful. I will say, um, I just want to point out the fact that obviously, and by the way, anybody who has any questions, send them in right now. Um, I'll check that in just a second. Um, you and I are like living examples of the power of nutrition and, you know, lifestyle, I'm sure, you know, we've both done plenty of therapy and other things, but nutrition is a huge, huge, huge part of me 
and I know you too, rebuilding a totally broken body that I destroyed with alcohol and drug use from such and, and brain, you know, I started drinking when I was 13. And that's yeah. really and I think you were similar too, like with yeah, your 14. difference. Yeah. yeah. So um, I mean, as so much in you know, when you when you bring up post acute withdrawal sy syndrome can be up to two years, some some people even longer, you know, yes. depending, you know, um, it is it's not it's not two weeks like this is it's a while. And you can shorten it with all sorts of amazing things that you and I can provide and other recovery coaches and stuff. And it's like, um, first, so, I mean, I got to tell you the protein, fat and fiber thing I ate and took in and still do so much fat. It is so nourishing for my body, the good fats. Like there was a period of time when I could honestly drink you know, three quarters of cup of heavy cream diluted with a little water with my herbs, my Ayurvedic herbs, because my body was just like, you know, yeah. like, yeah, you know, and you can just tell like, just fat to rebuild our brain, you know, we destroy it with drug use. Yeah. And the brain is primarily made of fat. So obviously, yeah. you're not going to repair your brain with carbs. And right. with, pro you know, with protein, you are too, but fat is so and for the nervous system, if you just imagine, you know, just the conduit of, you know, wiring in our bodies and we strip it raw with yeah. you know, too much sugar and all of this kind of stuff. And the fat rebuilds that, you know, casing around all of it, which is like you feel it in your body. You don't feel like this electromagnetic, you know, just hypersensitive mess anymore. Yes, absolutely. When it comes so. to the, the function and the structure of your brain. Fat is essential. I mean, like you said, it's like 60% a part of the brain. And so many of us are totally deprived of omega-3 fatty acids, which is one particular type of fat. And that, that supplement alone and that nutrient alone has a massive impact on reducing cravings for addictive substances. Um, because it, it has all of these, not only does it um, help with the structure and the function of the brain, so we were talking about those neurohormones. They have to be able to get from one area to the other. And so they, they follow these transport mechanisms and fat really supports that, that highway. You know, the highway is made of fat that these chemicals travel on. But omega-3 in particular has, you know, three different functions when it comes to specifically reducing cravings for drugs and alcohol. It, it acts as an MAOI, and, which means that it will actually block the enzymes that are trying to degrade dopamine in your brain. And it also, it in, it helps increase dopamine production by up to 40%. And it also enhances the binding of the dopamine to the receptor in the brain. So it, it makes more, it helps you make more dopamine It increases the, um, you know, locking into the receptor and it, you know, shunts away the enzymes that are trying to degrade it. And so amazing. It's yeah, so powerful. It's so, so many powerful. things. And we're not eating fish. So many of us are not eating fish. And so we're, and that's the primary source, fatty fish. And so that's why we're so deficient in it. But, you know, it's easy peasy. If you like, say you, you hate fish, take it. you take can it. take the supplement, you know, <laughs> yeah, um, totally it makes wow. a huge difference. Well, I want to bring up, I mean, there's obviously there's so much fascinating stuff here that we could go, you know, talk about. And I would love for people to work with you specifically. And I want to talk to you more about, you know, maybe in um, more interviews or whatever it is, just, I think, and people just, just research this stuff, really important, essential fatty acids. I mean, just look into that stuff. It's so big. And, you know, the protein, fat, fiber, you know, whole dynamic versus the food, God awful food pyramid, which is just such, you know, our government's, you know, horrible, like they should be sued for, creating a, you know, a paradigm of health that was so destructive and mm -hmm. whatever, we can go into that too. Yeah. Um, but even like, you know, flour, cigarettes, caffeine, I know that Kelly can be an incredible resource for you in, you know, dealing with getting off of those too. And I think in, you know, you've talked about in our class, how flour has an opiate. Um, so it, 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 you know, it links to the opiate receptors. So, you know, that when people get emotional about giving up bread, it's because there is an emotional link there and there's yeah. an addiction from flour. So it's like, these are really, really big things. And, um, and Kelly's awesome. And, you know, she, she can work with you with, you know, all of this stuff. It's fascinating. Like I said before, prevention takes a lot less time, energy, and money than recovery does. Um, so I think that's an important thing for us to remember. Um, there are some questions here. And yes. I'm going to also say if there are more, there's quite a few here. If there's, if we need to, because this ends at exactly, you know, 59 minutes, 
we will stop and then we'll come back on to finish the questions. Okay. Okay. If, if you have time for that. Yeah, and I do. The listeners too. And, um, and I'm going to say right now before this round ends, Nikki Aiello, Recovery and Life Transition Coach. So NikkiAiello.com. Um, I can help you kind of coordinate all the right people that you need for your recovery and, you know, your new lifestyle plan. And I'm, a, you know, support system and all, and I'm fun to work with. I'll go ahead and admit it. I'm just going to say that I'm fun to work with. And, you know, there's, I've had a lot of success with, with people I've worked with and I love doing it. And Kelly is the addiction nutritionist. Her link is in my bio. It's the addiction nutritionist.com. And her name's Kelly Miller. So my friend, okay. So I've got my niece on here. She's sending some questions. My, um, uh, and my dear friend, De uh, Demita has too. So let's see here. Demita, I'm going to go to Julie first. Any thoughts on veganism and serotonin? I know you mentioned the protein has a lot of effect on it. Yeah, this is a tough one. Um, there's very, so this is my personal opinion, uh, based off of the research that I've done and, and the training that I've had and the education that I've sought out. There are very few individuals that can really thrive on a vegan or vegetarian diet. Um, not to say that there aren't individuals that can, um, there are. Um, but if we're just looking at numbers and, uh, and statistically speaking, it's a very small amount of individuals. Um, and I won't get into it now, but blood type really plays a huge role in this. So knowing your blood type um, is really important for this. Um, and the reason I say that, so if we were talking specifically about recovery, um, veganism and vegetarianism is highly, uh, it's highly restrictive. Um, and if you're, if you're entering into recovery, you're already dealing with quite a bit of restriction. So that's kind of hit number one to where I would say, this is really not the best fit for most people um, entering into recovery. Um, secondly, when we're talking about animal proteins, um, you just get more bang for your buck. You really, really do. It is much, um, when we're talking about amino acids, amino acids are amino acids, right? Um, and so whether you're getting an amino acid from quinoa versus, um, uh, you know, a steak or something like that, it's the same molecule. Um, but it, it's not the problem with sourcing those amino acids. It's, it's how much protein can you really get? Are you able to hit protein goals while eating a vegan and vegetarian diet that is a true vegan or vegetarian diet that's really plant-based and not so much, um, you know, a lot of your calories are coming from sugar or refined flours or that sort of thing. Um, and so if we're talking specifically about building your neurotransmitters, you know, you just get more bang for your buck if you eat a piece of meat. There's, if we're looking at an egg, I mean, an egg is literally the most perfect food. It's about 50% fat, 50% protein. The nutrition in the yolk is mind blowing. The bioavailability of the protein of an egg is rated at 100%. As to other proteins um, that you may be getting from different sources of food, but they're not as bioavailable. Um, now, if somebody comes to me and says, I'm in recovery, um, but, uh, you know, and, and I'm thriving on a vegan diet, then I might ask them a few questions. Um, but if somebody tells me they're thriving, then I'm not gonna say, you know, you're doing it wrong or you should stop or whatever. Like I'm all about like all pathways, right? Um, but when somebody comes to me and wants my honest advice about, should I try it or what do you think? I'm always gonna go in the direction of, if you're okay eating animal proteins, um, if you're open to it or whatever, let's go that route first. Because I know that that person's gonna heal faster, quicker. They're gonna need less supplements. Their food's gonna be more, bio more bioavailable. Um, and they're just not putting themselves at risk as much for creating a lot of anxiety and depression and that sort of thing. And I, I'm a, you know, living example there too. I do not do well without animal protein. I have to eat a lot of it, a lot of it. You know, veganism is just not, and vegetarianism is just not an option for me. Yeah. And so, you know, and I just make really great, you know, ethical choices, yeah. you know, and I, I seek out high quality, you know, meat and, you know, try and support farms and farmers and, you know, that I know are raising their animals well. And so it just, it takes some, Absolutely. investigation research and it's going to cost more yes but you know what are your value you know then sure. you just kind of rate your values you know i've sure. yeah so Absolutely. thank you julie for that one um i'm gonna say that so demita's got a few questions and i'm gonna ask one of them and then we'll probably switch over and demita i wrote them all down so that we will get to them as soon as we switch over because i'll lose the commenting here um but she wants to know what your 
Um, and we'll just talk until this stops. Okay. And then we'll okay. just start right on. Uh, she wants to know what your take is on intermittent, intermittent fasting and um, its relationship to serotonin. Um, intermittent. I, so I'll just come out and say that there's like a ton of therapeutic benefits to intermittent fasting. Who is the right candidate for intermittent fasting is really the right question. Um, cause it's not going to be the best fit for everybody. And, and it, and because this conversation is around addiction, um, that's the take that I'll, I'll kind of put the spin on. Um, I do not recommend intermittent fasting in the first, a minimum, the first for, for, uh, first two years of recovery, because going back to when we were talking about balancing your blood sugar, if you're intermittent fasting and you haven't done it properly and, um, you haven't laid the groundwork for balancing your blood sugar first and kind of switching over to that ketone, um, you know, ketogenic lifestyle, you're risking going into that danger zone of your blood sugar dropping too low. Um, so intermittent fasting is a wonderful tool for the right person. Um, but because we're here talking about addiction and recovery, I highly, highly don't recommend it for people in those first few years. And if you get over the hump of those first few years um, and, and you're working with somebody to make sure that you're not suffering from nutrient deficiencies and because that's a big one, because um, you are you're, you're usually reducing the amount of food that you eat um, when you do intermittent fasting because you're lowering the number of meals um, and you've done the groundwork to, to balance your blood sugar, you know, maybe you're the right candidate. But just generally speaking, the first few years of recovery, um, highly don't recommend it. And I'll speak to that. I've tried all kinds of things, which is another reason that the, the work that I do, I, I've, I know what works and I know what is dangerous for, you know, um, through my own experience, you know, so I like to help people from making decisions that aren't going to be helpful, mm -hmm. you know, because I've already tried it and, you know, and I have resources and stuff too. other people, a lot of information. Um, and oh, can I just tail end on, on what she said too? Cause I didn't yeah. really address the serotonin part. Oh, so yeah. you know how I was talking about serotonin is made from that single amino acid called tryptophan. Yeah. There's 20 amino acids. The weakest of the bunch is tryptophan. It has the most difficult time getting into the brain. Um, there's a, a basically like a sack around your brain called the blood brain barrier. And its purpose is to keep pathogens out and viruses and bacteria and only allow very specific things in there. And tryptophan gets, he's like the little guy. He gets muscled out by the other amino acids and he has a much harder time crossing that blood brain barrier. And so if you are intermittent fasting or doing anything that's kind of lowering the nutrient intake um, and restricting the food, you're, you're increasing, um, uh, you're, you're, you're increasing the prevention of tryptophan getting into the brain. So my, my initial reaction to that is it probably would be more detrimental um, to serotonin and the ketogenic diet is as well. There's quite a bit of evidence that um, the, ketog the ketogenic diet um, plays a huge role in depression, unfortunately. So again, that's not for everybody. There are people who the ketogenic diet is absolutely a great fit for, but if you're somebody that's dealing with depression already, uh, you know, I would really caution about doing keto for sure. I want to talk to you more about that once we get back on, maybe if we can, if you have time. Okay. Um, but I did want to say that intermittent, intermittent fasting did not, was, did not do well for me at all. It just made me so volatile. Mm. It was horrible. You know, yeah. I just really felt, you know, just all of those effects of poor blood, blood sugar and just all of that stuff. Yeah. So I hope that was helpful to and I know she, and she knows too, she knows that, you know, sugar is a big, plays a huge role in her life. She has mm -hmm. tremendous um, sugar cravings and she's, um, but she's working on it for sure. She made Great. a little, she made a little statement about that. Um, I think we're still going a little bit. Uh, so she also brought up hunger pangs. What about when you have hunger pangs and when you eat even nourishing food, you're still not satisfied? What mm -hmm. do you, do you feel like, I feel like maybe if you have hunger pains, maybe you've just let yourself go too long without food. Yeah, that can be coming from a number of places. So my initial reaction is, is if you're hungry, you should eat. <laughs> That's kind of like my number one rule, right? <laughs> if you're hungry, you should eat. Um, and if you have, and hunger really should roll in, like it should be kind of a rolling in feeling where you're like, if you're paying, you're kind of practicing paying attention to hunger. It shouldn't be like a hunger pain strikes you out of nowhere. Your body will give you signals that hunger is rolling in. And so when you learn that mindfulness, you know, intuitive eating and kind of 
being more connected to your body, you'll notice hunger kind of slightly rolling in and that's your cue to go ahead and get food. So if you're having pangs, hunger pangs, that usually is a signal that you have one probably waited too long to eat. Um, but there can be other reasons for that. So if you eat and you experience hunger very shortly after that, there's two things. I would look at the, the makeup of your food. If it was primarily carbohydrates or sugar, that's probably why you're being led to eat again. So if you've ever had McDonald's, you'll realize I feel satisfied for about two minutes. And 30 minutes later, you're like, oh, I just had two Big Macs and a large fry. Why am I hungry again? Because uh, none of that food was nourishing. And your body, your body needs nutrients. And if you don't put nutrients in that pocket, it's just going to keep saying, feed me, right? And so, um, um, so that's one. And then the other thing I wanted to mention is that insulin resistance, which is very, very common, will cause you to feel hungry when you are like you're eating you feel like you're eating regularly but you're still always hungry well it's because your cells are starving so you're put your you're eating you feel hungry you put food in your body but the nutrients aren't getting where they need to go there's the basically the door to your muscles has been closed and it's not allowing anything else in it's not allowing the energy in and so it'll tell the brain well you know we're starving down here we need more nutrition but the door is closed um, that's what insulin resistance is. So if you feel like, well, I'm eating all the time, but I'm still always hungry. Those are kind of the two things I would look at. Like, what are you eating that may be potentially causing you to feel hungry all the time? And two, could it potentially be insulin resistance, which is primarily caused by a hard carb, high carb, high sugar diet. So how does somebody go and figure all this stuff out? Can they do it through you or do they have to go get lab, lab work for like yeah. insulin resistance and stuff? Or is yeah. it both? No, if somebody um, suspects that they have insulin resistance, I don't test for it, but I can absolutely work with those individuals. Um, and oftentimes insulin resistance is easily reversible without even getting the diagnostic tests. But if you're the kind of person that wants to have the data, it's a very simple test you can request um, through your primary care physician um, just to kind of get the, the concrete evidence that you have insulin resistance. Um, but whether you confirm it or not with a diagnosis, the treatment um, is the same, or I shouldn't say treatment, I should say, you know, nutritional protocols and that sort of thing is the same. So very easily reversible. If, if somebody's concerned about that, I could work with them for sure. There you go, everybody. I will also say that um, I thought it was interesting in doing your course that um, as far as, you know, kind of uh, making a diagnosis of, you know, what neurotransmitters you might be low in when we were doing that. Um, it was more effective that I learned from you to do it based, uh, symptomatically rather than going in to get lab work. Plus, I don't think they haven't really mastered labs for neurochemistry anyway. So, um, so that makes sense. So right. you're not going to get accurate data there. But how effective just, you know, doing the system as symptoms assessment was, was yeah. really interesting to me. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Basically, urine and blood tests are not very accurate. If you want to get a really accurate reading of, of say, serotonin, you need a platelet test or to be able to tap into your cerebrospinal fluid, which is really not practical. Um, and so a symptom test is actually much more effective. And the thing that I'm going to be launching in January, the new program that I'll be launching, um, is actually a bioenergetic test um, that I imagine is going to line up really well with that symptom checker. Um, and, and I won't go too much into it now, but um, serotonin, dopamine, any of these chemicals have a very specific energetic pattern. And by taking urine and hair samples and running it through this um, program, you can pick up on those energetic patterns. And so we will be able to start seeing some actual data in terms of uh, neurotransmitter production. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. my God, I can't wait I'm to do super that. I'm excited about it. Yay. <laughs> wow. Okay. So do you have some courses coming up for people or programs? What's coming yeah. up that people can do with you? So I'm taking a very, very limited amount of one-on-one -on -one clients through the end of the year. So, you know, we're already in November, November and um, December. I really only have about two spots left open for one-on-one -on -one clients. Um, but starting in January, I'll be relaunching my small group program. Um, and I will probably do more than one of those to give lots of opportunities. Um, so there might be an evening one and a day one. And those are very small. So we really limit it at five individuals. Um, and it's four weeks. It takes about a month to get through it. You know, we, um, we do some recorded teachings and then we do a live zoom every week to get together. Basically what I'm doing is helping you walk through creating, um, your own targeted supplement and amino acid protocol while 
also following the PAWS nutritional protocols um, and then tracking everything, you know, with food diaries and that sort of thing. Um, and you take the amino acid test in the beginning and at the end. So you can kind of see, uh, you know, how much progress you've made in those certain areas. So I'll be relaunching that in January. So I will start, you know, kind of heavily advertising that in December, but you're welcome to uh, reach out and sign up for that to secure your spot whenever you're ready. And then I'll be also launching the, the bioenergetic testing programs. Um, and so I don't have a ton of details about what that will look like, um, but I'll be uh, advertising that in December as well. And then I will also be opening, you know, reopening up my one-on-one -on -one clients. So from now until the end of December, just a couple openings for one-on-one -on -one, um, programs. But I have programs really geared towards anything. Like if you're looking to just quit smoking, I have a nicotine-free program. I have an alcohol-free program. I have, you know, a sugar-free program. So whatever it is that you're looking for, you know, we could work together a single session, four weeks, six weeks. Um, you know, it's really kind of designed to what you're, you know, and tailored toward what, towards what your needs are. So... Wow, that's so great. I want some yeah. corporations to bring you in and help just on a large scale with their employees too, you know, smoking yeah. and stuff. Seems like it, that would be a good one. Yeah, I would love to do that. I feel like we might have to end this. I'm, I'm surprised that it went at, let us go longer than an hour. I really hope that it's letting me record this and up and post it, even though it's longer than an hour. So I, I guess I'll find I don't, I don't have a timer on my side. How long has it been? It's just been an hour and like eight minutes. Oh, but okay. usually it stops it at an hour mm -hmm. and then IG, um, IGTV only lets you upload an hour, um, an hour. So anyway, oh, okay. Okay. but we'll see what happens. But I know this was super, super great. And I'm, um, I'm really glad that you guys tuned in. Let me see if there's just any last little things that people sent in. Yes. Thanks for those questions, everybody. So really? easiest way to reach me is through email, yeah. which is Kelly at the addiction nutritionist.com. Um, but obviously I have my Instagram you could go to my website. Oh, there's a there's some free tools on my website. So if you go to my website and sign up for the newsletter, um, you can download a really beautiful infographic that shows you all the foods on the pause protocol. Um, and then there's another little handout there that talks a little bit more about the foods and the, the specific nutrients too. That's so awesome. Thank you, Kelly, so much. I'm so yeah. excited to like introduce so many people to you. Thank you so much for having me. This has been amazing and you're amazing. And I, I'm so excited to see what we're gonna do in the future. Oh, and yeah, by the way, everybody, Kelly and I and another um, therapist are um, talking about possibly creating a program for college students, teens and college students. It's going to incorporate therapy, nutrition, and coaching to yeah. help them through this really kind of challenging, not so ideal college transition yeah. and high school, just all of it. So anyway, we'll, be, we'll keep you posted on all of that. Thank you for tuning in. And um, yeah, see you next time. All right. Thanks. Okay. Bye, Bye, everybody.